All right, take your seats, class. Uh, we are back in session. Seems like it's been forever, hasn't it? Been a little yes. while. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I know here in Lake Orion, uh, students were back in school uh, on Tuesday, the day after Labor Day. Some schools started before that. Um, when I was a kid, school always started after Labor Day. Was that the case with you guys? Yes. I don't know why they would rush kids back to school before Labor Day. That would stink as a kid. Yeah, like like, this, like the second week of August in some cases. Yeah, like, yeah. Why? Well, who, what sick, twisted plan is this? So this I is, know. And they don't get off until second week of June or something sometimes. Yeah. It used to be Memorial Day weekend was, up. Oh, school, school's done. Yeah. Give me June through August, man. And we'll go back after Labor Day. And then, of course, on Facebook, you see all the pictures of the kids with their hair combed and holding their lunchbox and smiling for the camera and it's all heading out to school. It's uh, They're all lies. I can tell you that <laughs> surfing is better not in June, and only about halfway through July does it start to warm up, like in California. Yeah, right. You hit, you hit August, and it's like, it's beautiful. And everybody's like, oh, we're going back to school. It's like, I just got started. Yeah. It's hard. Now, that's another thing. When I was younger, August used to be really, really hot. Now it feels like the start of fall. Yes. Uh, Spirit Halloweens are starting to open all over the place in August. Wait, wait. Uh, it's, it's, it's pumpkin cool. spice it, is back. It's cool here, Joe. I have friends in Phoenix <laughs> have had 100 days straight of triple digits. So it just depends on where you are. God bless the That's Midwest. True. Well, you know, when you move into the desert, yeah. you, uh, you got to expect Phoenix. that. And, Joe, you brought up a good point. We were gone for a while. I'm glad to know that uh, it's good that uh, Andrew is back from it's a country that has extradition laws. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, George got that thing with Interpol all cleared up. So we have both. We, did. we have we did. everybody back. Thank good. Time. But Thank I'd appreciate God, I just, it if you don't send me any more texts, guys. I just can't. Uh, they're going to catch me if I keep doing that. Well, <laughs> stop butt dialing us with your Facebook phone calls. I don't know. I've, I briefly considered uninstalling it. I'm like, yeah. Well, so. since we're all back, let's take roll call. Bueller. <laughs> Bueller. Bueller. If you haven't figured out by now... Today's episode of Hollywood Blockbusters is our back to school special. And uh, I guess uh, roll call is in order. I am your host, Joe Hollywood, and I'm joined by Imaginals Pete. Hey, hey. Andrew Walker. Howdy, howdy. And George Johnson. Cheers. All right. You guys got any? Are you wearing your new clothes that you went out and picked up at Target? No. no. <laughs> I'm wearing my finest beat me up clothes. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> it's funny. Nick over here is wearing a Batman shirt, and it reminds me of a time I was at a comedy club, and I was sitting at a table with some young, beautiful women, and I was the old guy at the table, and the comedian on stage looks down at me and says, what is the deal here? Why is this old guy sitting here with, like, three beautiful women? And I just said, I'm a stud. And he goes, yeah, right, you're wearing a Batman T-shirt, and the crowd just busted out laughing. It reminds me of that. So, all right. So, yes, this is our back to school special. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about our favorite movies that are somehow uh, connected with uh, school or college. And even uh, if you just want to work in that that coming of age film where if you were to create a Venn diagram, they kind of overlap a little bit that a lot of movies that are about coming of age stories uh, more often than not revolve around school. In some cases, you know, it takes place during the summer break between school. Um, so that's our goal today is to talk about our favorite school-related movies. Um, I'll start off with my, what I feel is the greatest high school movie ever made. Uh, and it came out a year after I graduated high school. So this was right in my wheelhouse here. And it really kind of, in a way, captured my high school experience. Not that I ever got held in detention or anything like that, but uh, I remember something about this movie just spoke to the people of my generation. And that is The Breakfast Club came out in 1985. Uh, just a brilliant movie written and directed by John Hughes, who just could do no wrong in the 80s. Um, every movie the guy released was a blockbuster smash. Uh, the cast was incredible. Emilio Estevez, Chad Nelson, Molly Ringwald, Ali Sheedy and Anthony Michael Hall, who I've met on a few occasions. And um, the movie earned $51 million, which doesn't sound 
like a lot by uh, today's standards, but its budget was $1 million. It was all filmed in one location. And so a $50 million profit is not too shabby in the uh, 1980s. And, of course, it's beloved uh, with critics and the audience, uh, 89% uh, positive score from the critics on Rotten Tomatoes, 92% from the audience. And, uh, you know, this is a movie I saw in theaters. Like I said, it really spoke to me. Of all the characters in the film, I probably related most to Anthony Michael Hall's character. And I'll never forget the line that he had in the movie when, you know, as they're bonding through this experience, as he gets toward the end of the movie, he says, you know, are, they're all from different cliques. And he says, you know, are you guys going to acknowledge me when you see me in the hallway come Monday? And Molly Ringwald was like, eh, probably not. <laughs> I was like, geez, that's cold. But that's, I don't know, that's kind of how it was in high school. You had your cliques. Um, but one thing I'm proud of uh, for my high school days is um, I never fell into any one clique. If I... If I had to pick one, it was kind of the nerd geek click, and that's that was kind of my strong suit. But I was friends with the jocks. I was friends with the stoners. I was friends with the foreign students who would come in. I just got along with everybody. I didn't have any enemies in, in high school. And, and that was good because some of the kids I went to school with were packing heat, and I wanted to be on their good side. So, so you were red from Shawshank. <laughs> you could communicate like, with every group. You just had, it was like very Game of thrones -y. Yeah, right. You you got to got to get along with everybody cuz you never know when you need someone to have your back. But uh so yeah, that movie had a huge influence on me, you know, very funny, very moving, dramatic at times. Um but such a a huge phenomenon uh, when you think of the 80s. This is one movie that uh comes to mind when you talk about the great movies of the 80s. We're lucky it came out in 1985. Yeah. Could you imagine that come out today? Every would social media influ influence would have ruined every moment <laughs> recreating it. They would all would have come to the same high school, taking the pictures. This is where it was filmed. And yeah. they'd do the exact same dances and scenes. And <laughs> Doug, you go, you guys are just stomping on it. I was actually very impressed. Uh, earlier this year, uh, Orient Township did a State of the Township address. And we did parody videos uh, from various movies. And the school district wanted to get involved with the presentation. So we are like, well, do you have an idea for a video? And they said, we'll take care of it. And when they finally turned in their video, they were they did the whole dance sequence from Breakfast Club, and I was very impressed. They nailed it. The outfits, the moves, everything. It was pretty darn impressive. If you're going to do it, you have to do it right. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's like you, you walk up to like, are you sure you want to do this? Because if you mess up. Yeah. I remember no, seeing great. Breakfast Club for the first time, and um, you know, I, I grew up in a pretty Christian, hardcore family, and the, you, know, you don't see rated R movies, and I believe it's rated R. I don't know if it is because there's no real Can swearing. You, there's no. Do you see that there's? Is it rated R on there? Can I you see that real John fast? Nelson had a couple of uh, launched a few f bombs, didn't he? Anyway, I, I it seemed to me yeah. like it was pretty. Um, I'm pretty sure it's. I'm pretty sure it's R, if I'm not mistaken. But at the time, it was it was bold and it took some chances. Um, I think the fact that it all took place in one place. Um, it created the same feeling that they must have been going through. Like, God, we're all in the same place. It's all at the same time. Is that R? Yeah, it is R. Oh, I didn't. That I didn't surprises think it was, me. Yeah, no, it's but oh. but they do talk about you know um, I think they talk a little bit about suicide as well, right? And domestic abuse. And domestic abuse and some other things exactly. So um, I I liked the mu the movie a little bit. Uh, pardon, back up. I liked it a lot more later when I saw it because. At the time, it was so shocking, and it hit me hit me kind of between the eyes. I was like, wow, these people are being real. This right. isn't like, hey, let's show off, you know, I got her panties, you know, like, <laughs> what was that, pretty uh, pink or yeah, whatever. 16 candles. Uh, 16 yeah, candles. Yeah. It actually got into some things that, that I wasn't, I don't think, at that age prepared for. It, 85, I would have been 14. Mm -hmm. So it was like, wow, these guys are talking about real stuff. That was, yeah. to me, really a bold. And so if you look at it nowadays, and you think, well, oh, big deal. You've got you know other movies have come out since that have that have, that have that have gone beyond, but back then that was that was really gutsy. Yeah. I thought that was good. It took a lot of chances, and it was only a million dollars. I didn't know that million dollar budget. Yeah. It now was, there there are a couple of elements in the movie that haven't aged very well. You know, uh, Judd Nelson's character's treatment of Claire comes almost as abusive, and then they pair up together in the movie, which really bugged me because he was. 
borderline abusive toward her. Um, the other thing that hasn't aged really well is Ali Sheedy's character is convinced to transform her whole personality, her whole essence from being sort of goth and weird to like being more like Molly Ringwald's character. And I'm like, why? I liked her as the goth weird girl. Why did she have to pretty herself up and put makeup on? So Didn't, there's a couple women, of things. Women that love a makeover. Them. Women love, everybody loves I a guess. makeover, especially women. And so I think that, that, it was like, gosh, if you'd only just this, this, and that, you'd be so much more beautiful. <laughs> but I agree with you. She, I don't think she immediately fit that character, right. that persona. Exactly. Yeah. And then, of course, she gets paired up with Emilio Estevez's character. And uh, the one that I related to the most didn't have a girl. And uh, I'm like, come on, man. Odd man out. That stinks. It's okay. He creates one later. <laughs> <laughs> Him and his buddy create one on the computer. <laughs> oh, that's One right. Of the most amazing women ever. <laughs> yeah. They use uh, some uh, jumper cables and a Barbie doll, and uh, they wear uh, bras on their head. Anything larger than a. You, br- <laughs> you risk spraining your thumb. <laughs> like yeah. in a C cup, you risk spraining your thumb. That's a great line. Andrew, yep. please tell me you've seen this movie. Yes, one time. <coughs> mm, probably 18 years ago. It's been a long, wow. long time. Yeah, I just saw it one time in college and don't really remember it. <laughs> I, really? yeah. 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 I need to, I need to I need to watch it again. Well, because I, I remember liking yeah. it. Yeah. And my girlfriend at the time was like, "Oh, you got to watch this. You got to watch this." There it is. Yeah. You know, that's one of those things. I saw it in the theater, of course, when it came out, and then when it made its uh, way to cable, it was just one of those movies where any time you turned on HBO or something, it was always on. So, a lot of these movies from the 80s, one of the reasons they're so ingrained in my brain is because they were just always on. Yep. You would, would watch them over and over and over again. Would you classify uh, Breakfast Club as a comedy? Uh, comedy <sighs> drama, I guess you'd say. Yeah. Because there are some really funny parts right. in it. And yeah, they, and but they wind up using the whole. Yeah. They wind up using the whole thing as like the intro to Jumanji, right? All these kids have to stay and they have to clean up the basement on a Saturday. They all get in trouble. They're all from disparate backgrounds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I love that about that. They took the comedy part out of it and ran with it. I thought yeah. that was in the, and did some sci fi, but pardon me. No, no you're absolutely right. I, I think they, they use the word dramedy. Where, dramedy. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's dramatic elements and there's comedic elements. Um, I mean, if I had to categorize it, if I was dividing up my DVD collection by genre, I would probably put it in the comedy section, but. There's some serious yeah, moments. Like I think when, it's at home also. I mean, with with you know them crying and them, the kids saying, "What about you, Dad? What yeah. about you?" I mean, that's and everybody in the movie theater when I saw yeah. it was like, "Oh, oh, that's yeah. how it is. That's why this guy's a jerk. It's his backstory. It's his you know, it's his uh, because, origin story, right?" Because I noticed that in the '80s you had movies like that and Sixteen Candles and Pretty. I mean, you had and then. You go to the 90s and you have, it's all about the party and we got to get laid before the summer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it, and that seems to be the tone. Like, we have to throw this epic party. And it, that becomes the, whether it's Clueless, whether it's American Pie, whether it's, you, know, you just go in and you go like, oh, this is how it's going to be in the 90s. Yeah. Like, this is what we got to do. Our summer, the school's ending. I can't go, can't, can't graduate and become, be a virgin. We got to. Yeah. She's yeah. behind you the whole year, dude. You would think movies that were inspired by Breakfast Club would have gotten that formula right of mixing right. comedy and drama drama but like you said a lot of those movies just were heavy emphasis emphasis on comedy i like so. what you said could they make the, i i think you really could they make this movie today i i, I doubt I, it i don't I think, think that's what today's movie theaters are lacking are yeah. movies like this well, this what? summer lacked a lot well, i don't oh. i don't understand why you say no why they couldn't make it today they're not making movies. Like, I don't think it's they couldn't. I just oh. don't think they are. I think they'd be afraid to broach the topic. You'd always get some some executive like, ooh, I don't know if we can talk about that. I don't know if we can talk about that. Yeah. I don't know, what's the best way to talk about Or if the character comes across as misogynistic and you say, are you promoting misogyny? Can we afford to do that? I don't want to get canceled by Entertainment Tonight. <laughs> and everyone who goes, the early screeners who see it will say, oh, this movie is just going to, it's a toxic male masculinity. And it, it reinforces, yeah. and the, the negativity will kill you. Right. Before you've even had any preview. Well, I think what you're saying is the misogyny part, but the way that they did it is they, they humanized it. Nowadays, I think they try to say misogyny is bad, and so we're going to put that person in. We're not going to humanize no it. No context. No context. Yeah. And yeah. we started out that way in Breakfast Club, but that character, Judd, what's his name? Judd Nelson. Nelson. Yeah. Judd Nelson's character does finally pr- produce like what we're looking for, and it doesn't come till two-thirds of the way, or maybe a third of the way through or halfway yeah. And it's so satisfying. The characters oh. are different when they from the when you see them in the beginning to the end. That's a good 
Yeah, park. A little, a little good journey. All of them. Yeah, all of them go through a, a journey. Yeah, and it's and it's reinforced because the only adults are the janitor. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No. And the uh, yeah, the janitor and, and the, the principal. And the principal. Yeah, yeah. And there and the principal is unhinged, and you can tell that he's just vindictive and he's just mean. And so you're saying, oh, that's that's an indication of whatever their zip code is in that, that he's just he's he's such an evil, mean guy that he has to deal with this all the time. You, you believe yeah. that his experience is dealing with a whole lot of other people and you're thinking well, these people aren't that bad right right but no i think uh especially in that time period there there every movie in the 80s seemed it, ne- it needed some sort of villain and he kind of filled yeah. that villain role and a movie we're going to talk about later ferris bueller's day off that had the principal <laughs> yeah. as the villain so these movies always had some sort of villain the they needed that the yeah yeah figure. and that's what these movies are about it's anti-authority so yeah all right, let's move on to number two on my list. Um, that took 25 minutes. That was great. <laughs> that, was great though. that was fantastic. That's right. Uh, this one, uh, Breakfast Club, I said, I think is the greatest high school movie ever made. This one might be the greatest college movie ever made. I'm talking about Animal House, 1978, mm-hmm. written by, uh, I think, one of the funniest men that ever walked this earth, Harold Ramis, yeah. uh, with Douglas Kenny, who has a small role in the movie, and uh, someone named Chris Miller. Um, of course, the cast is off the charts. John Belushi, Karen Allen, Tim Matheson, Bruce McGill is D-Day. The uh, list goes on and on and on and on. It's just a smash hit. Uh, earned $141 million on a $3 million budget. Good this is in 1978. <laughs> uh, again, beloved by audiences uh, and critics alike. 91% from critics, 89% from the audience. Uh, I remember seeing this. Again, this is one of these movies I saw in the theater and then saw over and over and over again uh, on cable. And what's interesting is my mom was from Spain, and people in Europe aren't as repressed uh, to sex and nudity as people in America are. So my mom would take us to the movie theater, and we saw Porky's and Animal House and all that stuff. Like, you know, I'm 10, 12 years old sitting in a theater, you know, seeing scantily clad virgins running around. Um, And my mom just didn't think twice about it. She just was never offended by that stuff. Very progressive. Yeah, so I, I had a happy childhood. Uh, watching these movies in theaters and on cable. She never never came into a room and said, what are you watching? And it's like, oh, what's this? Oh, airplane? Okay. Um, so, yeah. So uh, I saw this movie more times than I could count. Uh, classic, great cast, great performances, laugh out loud funny. Um, one of my all-time favorite movies. Uh, Maginot's Pete, your, your thoughts on Animal House? This is surprisingly, I've only seen this movie a couple of times, and I enjoyed it, and it's iconic. It goes up there. I mean, when you can be parodied by The Simpsons, Saturday Night Live, ironically, and and it's referenced as, it's it's in Mount Rushmore mm-hmm. of, of, of the movies, where you can say it's Animal House. People are like, oh, okay. even if they're not familiar with it, they've heard of it. Mm-hmm. They know the characters. They know the Belushi. So I, I enjoyed it. I, uh, for some reason, I t- ended up gravitating towards Revenge of the Nerds. For the 80s college movie. That's a good one. But I, I enjoyed Animal House, but I always thought, you know, I got to do Revenge of the Nerds. I like the little... I agree with you. I liked Animal House, but Re- Revenge of the Nerds, I think I saw a lot more. Yeah. I, just... I, 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 I identified with him a lot more. I yeah, but no, I don't know. I, I have nothing but praise for, for Animal House. Yeah. Initially, when I... There was a time where I thought, oh, is it getting overhyped? Is this going to... Because if I... You know, people say, like, it's the, you have if you don't watch Animal House, you should be tarred and feathered. And then people will watch, and I go, "Ooh!" I, I, I never wanted to overhype it because I don't want people to go like Nick. If it's, yeah, it was all right. Yeah, no, and you know, and it's another uh, the theme you mentioned earlier, the anti-authority. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a, another perfect example of that with Dean Wormer, how uh, they just had no respect for Dean Wormer, and uh, yeah, it's it's a common theme that you're going to see in a lot of which these I movies. was I wanted to ask you and George this because it it it's in your generation in your time. Because everyone that was an, a principal or a dean in the 80s was probably <laughs> the, the villain. Was the hippie in the 60s, <laughs> 20 years earlier. Yeah, right. And then these guys Good turn point. into like these squares and they're turning around and being like, you kids with your rock music and mohawks <laughs> and your punk rock and your yeah. just punks. But they came through that. Uh, I mean, 
they could have been anti hippie in the sixties. Or were they the, the clean cut? The, like you should go to Vietnam. They could have been the <laughs> the McCarthy, you know, so, witch hunters, communist hunters. You so know? my kids have asked asked me a lot about fifties, sixties, seventies. Fifties is this perfect lifestyle. Everybody been through so much hell in World War Two and the forties. So the fifties yeah. kind of turned out to be perfect. The sixties was like. Well, we want to have sexual freedom and all this stuff. And then they go completely off the rail in the late 60s. Oh, yeah. Early 70s, which is when I was born and you were just a little kid. Yeah. Uh, 70 born for me. All of the music, not all of the music, a lot of the music was so, it lacked so much self-confidence. It was so like, in, it was, it was uh, introspective and the, the lighting on shows went from, I prefer the lighting on TV show sitcoms from the 70s or from the 50s and the 60s over the 70s. The 70s is just like, it's just a giant, put everything in reverse and everything's almond and brown and people have these terrible haircuts, at least in my opinion. <laughs> and you watch some of these things and they're trying to be real and they're trying to be raw because the 50s was always about, you know, June Clear. So by the time you get to the 80s, you you have you have the United States at least in my opinion it, it, toward the end of the seventy er, end of the sixties or early seventies you have this kind of pendulum swing from one side to be like we're all so you know miserable we did Vietnam we assassinated these people and and all this happened on our watch in the sixties then the, the the pendulum comes and swings back in the eighties and it's like capitalism and get your butt in gear and authoritarianism, authoritarianism and discipline yeah. that we didn't have in the 60s and the 70s. That had a lot to do with yeah. Reagan. You know, Reagan, he was Good the point. president yeah. of the Screen Actors Guild before becoming president of the United <laughs> States, and he was part of the, the communist hunts in Hollywood and blacklists and all that stuff. So, Good point. Yeah. And he was the governor of California. You know, a lot of people say, oh, California is so liberal. They've had Republican Major, governors for yes. a long, long time. And and not so that long ago with, with Arnold. Yeah, exactly. That's not that long ago with and yeah. so having you know Reagan in office, he was he was the anti-communist. Uh, you know, if you're not with us, you're against us, sort of a thing. And the '80s kind of uh, reflected that mentality. Excellent yeah. point. Thank you. But what's interesting, what you were saying, this is getting a little off topic, but yes, a lot of the TV shows, when you think about it, sort of started to embrace that anti-establishment thing because you had like the Cosby Show and everything that depicted like the perfect American family. And then Roseanne comes out, and it's like anti-Cosby. And then they took it to the limit with uh, uh, Married with Children, which is like the opposite of Cosby. So, like, later in the 80s, they started embracing that anti-establishment thing going into because the Because it fits into what you guys were talking about. Another movie that I enjoyed, you know, on top of Animal House, because I always put that up there, but with Revenge of the Nerds, Real, Real Genius with Val Kilmer. Yeah. You know, it's these, these 80s, it's all about, you know, they're... They're go go eighties, and again, it's this professor who's and who's basically like the dean. He has that kind of power. Is this? He's he's the reporter in Die Hard. It's a great character actor in Die Hard. He's the reporter that keeps getting hit. Oh, and they keep uh. call, they keep calling him Jerry. It's just, <laughs> but I think if you see his face, you, you you'll you'll know who he is. Uh, but again, ap- he was was he the guy in Ghostbusters that shut yeah. down the? Uh, he's the grid? EPA guy. Yeah, it's he's like great. Atherton, I think, yeah. is his name. Is yeah, this yeah. true? Yes, this man has no. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's great, but like Michael J. Fox is the embodiment of what you're talking about. Just go, yeah. go, oh, take advantage Republican. of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yes, exactly. Yeah, and so yeah, so I, that's why I wonder if that was a theme because from high school to college, these these kids are like, we're nothing's impossible. We're we're going to dream it. We're going to just keep going. Hell, to hell with the consequences. Anybody that tries to stop us, to hell with them. Especially you, Dean. Especially you, Professor. <laughs> yeah. Especially you, yeah, Principal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one story I did want to share regarding yeah. the Animal House is, uh, and I may have brought this up before, but back in 2000, I was an extra on the movie 61, which was filming at Tiger Stadium at the time. The movie was released on HBO the following year. And on the very first day of filming, I was a reporter, so they gave me like a vintage tape recorder with a microphone. And they, the, the casting people called me over and said, okay, you're going to stand right here. You're going to be interviewing someone in the background during this scene. I'm like, cool, tell me where to stand. And so then they bring over the guy that I'm interviewing or pretending to interview, and his name is Bruce McGill, who played D-Day in Animal House. So I'm like, hello, Mr. McGill, nice to meet you. And so we're in the background. What? And as we're standing there between scenes, I'm like, do I ask him about Animal House and <laughs> risk like getting escorted off the set or do I keep my mouth shut, you know? So I tried to be professional. I tried not to bring it up the first day. 
And so then at the end of the filming day, they said, all right, we need to pick this up tomorrow. Everyone come back. We're all wearing the same stuff we wore the day before. We're all back in the same spot. And he starts just volunteering stories about Animal House. No. And I just soaked it <laughs> up. Like when, when John Belushi is like running around in the rain and they're like trying to sneak into the Dean Dean's office or whatever, and he like slips and falls. Apparently he really slipped and fell oh, and got like really angry about it. And but they're like, just keep going, just keep just going. Keep <laughs> so he gets up and he looks and he runs. <laughs> and he's telling me how, you know, they're all behind the camera laughing hysterically and John Belushi's ticked off. And I just couldn't get enough of it. And so I got to share a scene with That is so with, cool. And when they cut to a close up of Bruce McGill in sixty one, you see kind of an over the sh shoulder shot of me pretending to interview him. And uh, that was pretty cool having that moment with, that with Bruce cool. McGill talking nice. about one of my all time favorite movies. So yeah. Andrew, did you chime in on animal house? Anything you want to contribute? I haven't chimed in. Uh, same thing with breakfast, breakfast club. I saw it in college and don't remember any. Wow. Anything from it. Those movies are so impactful for me. No, it's I, amazing to me that they didn't reverberate with you. A lot of those movies I watched in college, like we were also partying and we weren't really paying a lot of attention. <laughs> I'm sure there was a lot of alcohol involved. So, <laughs> yeah, um, I do. Re I do remember that this, uh, this image always stuck in my head with Belushi uh, chugging that Jack Daniels bottle. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's that's Coca-Cola. Come on, guys. Come on. But then I'm like, oh, wait, this is Jim Belushi. So uh, John Belushi. Uh, John, yeah. yeah, John Belushi. So uh, I know he's a partier. But uh, I remember liking it. I just don't remember, like, too many specifics of it. Kind of a sad footnote. I don't know if you guys remember this, but uh, Animal House was so popular, they tried to turn it into a TV series. You remember that? And they called it Delta House. And uh, the the chubby guy, I forget what his character's name was, Flounder, uh, he was one of the few cast members that actually signed up for the TV series. And it was a miserable yeah, failure. Better. You can't capture the essence of Animal House on television. You just can't. Joe, just if anyone had it forgotten up. it, well, thank you. You <laughs> just brought it back to the forefront. This is like the Star Wars Christmas special. People don't it know is. about it, and then you mention it, and you're like, oh, God, that's right. Yeah, it was one of the worst TV series. Like, you, no, it's just such a bad idea. Even like if someone were to say, "Oh, let's do a sequel," no, nah, you can't do a but sequel. But it got to made. It actually yeah. made it on screen. No yeah. one stopped this. No one put someone the brakes on this thing. Gave it the green light. So. That's an idea you take out to the backyard, put two in the in the head. You don't. <laughs> you don't let it get out. Like that's right, buddy. That's Look what happens when you, you surround yourself with yes people. You go you go full of mice and men. That's right, George. <laughs> that's right, buddy. Just go, go, go. You go to see the bunny, George. <laughs> Look at the flowers. Tell yeah. me about the rabbit, George. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> All right. The next movie that I want to talk about was just a monster, monster hit. Had such a huge impact on me. And it's funny. When I talk to my male friends about this, they all kind of talk in hushed tones and whispers because they're like, it's kind of a guilty pleasure, but I don't really talk about it in public. And the movie I'm talking about is Grease, uh, 1978. Uh, directed by Randall Kleiser, starring, of course, John Travolta, Libby Newton-John, Stockard Channing, Jeff Conaway. Uh, get this, on a $6 million budget, and this is 1978 money, it grossed $396 million on a $6 million budget. Wow. Um, the audience on Rotten Tomatoes seemed to like it more than the critics, which surprised me. Only 66% from the critics, but 87 from the audience. Now, the funny thing is, and I don't know, as a kid, I was 12 years old when this came out. I don't remember thinking about this, maybe because I was so young. But as I got older, I started questioning the age of the cast. Yeah. Like, yes. as a kid, high, school, high schoolers looked more grown up to me because I was a kid. But then as I got to high school and would rewatch Grease, I'm like, these guys are all still much older than me. So Travolta, during the filming of Greece, was 23 years old. Livia Newton-John, 29 years old. Okay. Rizzo was 33 <laughs> years old. Uh, Marty Maraschino was uh, 21 years old. And Putsy was probably closest to uh, high school age. He was 20. But imagine Rizzo at 33 years old playing a high school senior. That's pretty funny. I got to be honest with you. That really did create dissonance with me. Like when yeah. watching it, you're like, wait, what are these guys doing? Because they're... <laughs> 
They're all they're all adults. They're not high school students. Why are they playing at high school? I didn't get that as a kid. Yeah, yeah. I thought they all got held back. <laughs> That's repeatedly. possible. That's probably true, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Was it? Uh, I forget which character it was like. Seven years of high school down the drain. I forget what movie yeah. that was in. But. So, but Olivia Newton-John was 29. 29 I mean, Sandy I would have thought M. 23, 24, so she actually did pretty well. But it's like, yeah. uh, who played the Wiz? Uh, who was it? Uh, was it? Uh, oh. Michael Jackson? No, no, no. The, in the Wiz, it was, who was Dorothy in the Wiz? Uh, anyway, um, she was like Diana 40, Ross. Diana Ross. Diana Ross. Yeah, she yeah. was like 40 or something like that. <laughs> something terrible. It's, like, it's kind of the same thing. Gre- yeah. Gre- Grease was... What Beverly Hills 90210 was when they cast him, like these are all like these are all actors in their twenties. <laughs> Luke Perry had crow's feet for God's sakes <laughs> as a high schooler. I'm like, what are we doing here? <laughs> now the other other interesting interesting thing about Greece is as a kid watching the movie, there were certain lines and references that went over my head. Yeah, and Until only you later, it with, I, yeah, with the subtitles, and all of a sudden, oh, yeah, that's what they're talking about. Yeah, I don't know, Joe. Tell me more. Tell me more. Tell Did me she more. put up a fight? <laughs> <laughs> I went up. Oh, like, well, come on, putsy. Um, but here's here's a weird thing. So uh, years ago, like in the late eighties, <coughs> uh, when I was working in video production, and we would record dance recitals. And I remember all these little kids came up like three, four, five years old. Girls had poodle skirts on. I think there was one little boy with a leather jacket on. Yeah. They come out and the music from Grease Lightning starts to play. And I'm thinking, now they had to have censored this. They're not going to let these kids dance to this song. Somehow, whoever made those creative decisions never actually listened to the words to Grease Lightning. And as the song is, it's it's saying some very vile stuff. These toddlers are doing choreographed dance routine oh, no. to very suggestive lyrics, and I thought that was hysterical. Look, it's not the same thing, but it's it's like when people thought the Yin Yang song, "Ah, skeet, 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 skeet," and I'm like, you know what they're saying, right? You can't, you guys can't be saying that right now. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, so people love that movie, of course, but I don't think a lot of people picked up on the innuendo and. Some of it wasn't so subtle. Like, there's a scene during the the, the choreographed Grease Lightning uh, song where John Travolta takes a roll of saran wrap and he, he like, rubs it against his crotch back and forth and then he throws it over his shoulder. Well, as a kid, I'm like, what the hell was that? I don't know what that was. Apparently, in the 50s, if you didn't have access to a condom, you used saran wrap. And I'm like, I did not know that. Oh, that's interesting. We we would use the the corners of uh, garbage bags and, and rubber bands. <laughs> I don't know that I wanted to know that. No, uh, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, there goes sleep for this week. No, but I think that 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 Greece is 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 beautifully colorful. It's about the '50s, a time when it was supposed to be more innocent, right? And you get these wildly popular songs, and they're all choreographed. It makes sense that this is a tween kind of a thing, right? Or yeah. that it's a PG PG thirteen at really at most. But these are they're getting into some R stuff, yeah. and 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 I I don't. My wife and I have talked about this a number of times. We had no idea what they were talking about as kids. Yeah, I don't think our parents would have let us watch that, or they would have at least said, oh, "Let's fast forward this part." No, nothing like that. Yeah, and this kind of falls under the category of what we talked about before the coming of age film, yeah. where. Even though these were all adult actors playing teenagers, the theme of the movie are that these teenagers are transitioning into adulthood and exploring the things that you would explore. Did they have a pregnancy teenager. scare in the movie too? They did. Rizzo yeah. thought she had a bun in the oven, as they say. And uh, yeah, there's uh, all kinds of interesting references. Saran uh, wrap did not work. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought that Saran wrap wouldn't come? And got to got to use two rubber bands. Uh, <laughs> got a double I'm, bag. And I'm telling you, at the end, I I don't know how funny. you guys felt. The car flew at the end. I said, did anyone go to pay attention? Like that was we just, weird. And it was like out of like a plastic shell over it. It's like, what did this turn into? Some weird. She's looking sci-fi. over and waving after him. Like, dude, did you have a flying car this whole time? Lead with that. That's how you score. Well, here's, you know, <laughs> there are people who come up with these weird uh, fan theories about movies that they mean more than what you're seeing on film. And one of the interesting fan theories about Greece is there's a line, you know, during the Summer Lovin' song, you know, Tell Me More, Tell Me More, where he says uh, she nearly drowned, 
Well, people are saying that she did drown <laughs> and that the whole movie is like, you know, limbo or whatever, and that <laughs> final ascension to heaven is at the end of the film. I like, love that theory. That's what? wild. <laughs> what Holy dark mo- corner of the internet <laughs> pulled this out of their ass. I think it's I really stretching yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, look, I mean, I'm all for a certain thing, but I'm like, you, yeah, buddy, you need a hug? Like, what is going on with this? Like, that's the, oh, wow. Hey, to each their own. Yeah. So do you guys have any fond memories of Greece or... Uh, I know that's way before. I your think time, they must but... have sold a ton of the, the records because we. Oh, had I one. own the records. I still own the records. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Xanadu as well. Yeah, yeah. Olivia Newton-John and. Yeah, she was America's darling. I, I'll be honest. Line. I I am not a fan of Grease only because it was that was the one of those movies where it's overhyped a lot, and it was just beaten into me the soundtrack over yeah. and over, and because I know a lot of my friends were growing up, especially the girls liked it. And they would keep playing and referencing, and I'm going like, well, I'm going to walk into traffic now because <laughs> I can't stand this. I mean, you know, as you know, it, it was based on an enormously successful Broadway show, and a uh, movie was inevitable, and they made mo- uh, changes for right. the film or whatever. But I do have to admit, uh, a number of years ago, they did a live production of Grease on television, and they toned down a lot of that innuendo stuff, and I thought it was actually very, very enjoyable. I thought it was really well done. But again, just like what you, I've seen the movie. I've seen it a few times. I don't really have it's unfair. I have unfair hatred towards it because it, it, all my aggression and aggravation came from outside <laughs> pile on. Like if people had not done and hyped it the way it did, I probably would have had a much better outlook on this movie. But again, somebody in Hollywood thought, you know what, this needs a sequel. Oh, and then too. actually <laughs> went into production. That's another thing that should have been just launched out of a cannon, but they did it. And when they do it, you go, you can't help but tie the two together. I'm like, you're because they brought what's her face back. She was the one consistent. I'm like, did you not graduate, lady? Was it Frenchie or Frenchie? Which one? Was, yes, did she come back. I, yeah, she's in that second movie. I said, did you just stay? Because you're wearing the same. It was outfit. everybody else was everybody else had moved on. Right? This was like you yeah, had, the next class or whatever. It was Michelle Pfeiffer. Michelle Pfeiffer and uh, Math. Matt, somebody, I can't, I can't remember his no. name. But, you know, on, on social media and stuff, there are certain things that will cause me to block someone on social media. And whenever somebody says, I prefer Greece 2 over Greece, yeah. I block them. I am done with them. They are oh. trolls. They are provoking me. Yeah. I don't want to have to deal with anyone who says Greece 2 is superior to Greece. Greece 2 was garbage i'm sorry i mean look people who say that grease 2 is better than grease 1 is basically like saying my feel-good movie is sophie's choice <laughs> like that, that's their mentality like that's what makes me smile i wake yeah. up in the morning and i put on sophie's choice and i have a smile ear there are ear. some funny parts in so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, really, of you the really have to weed and, and, and then for a quick pick me up i go to schindler's list <laughs> i'm like all right well i love grease and uh still do and it, on a rainy Sunday afternoon, I'll pop in Greece and watch it. The songs are catchy, whether you like them or not. They will they will find you, the part of your brain, and they will grab it. And then like the, the one ring, they will never let you go. I do the hand jive the entire song. When, when that scene <laughs> comes up in the movie, I do the hand jive. And I hope Andrew knows what I'm talking about when I say that, because I, that I, uh, could sound inappropriate. But. Yeah, I'm going to tell you, for, for a different generation, you have no, there's no context to that. It's already gone viral, Joe. I, I heard the song. As a matter of fact, I was at a car show over the weekend, and they played that song, and I so badly wanted to do the hand show. It was pretty awesome. All right, number four on my list. Uh, again, this this movie isn't so much about school as it is skipping school, even though I do think it qualifies for our topic today, uh, and that is Ferris Bueller's Day Off, 1986. Another John Hughes movie written and directed by John Hughes, of course, starring Matthew Broderick, Alan Ruck, Mia Sarah as Sloan, uh, Jeffrey Jones as the principal, Ed Rooney, who's hysterical, and Jennifer Grey, who's just angry throughout the entire film as uh, Ferris's sister, Jeannie. She's hilarious in this film. Uh, earned seventy million dollars on a five million dollar budget. Jesus um, Christ, just printing money. Back yeah, then. Uh, beloved by critics and audience. Eighty three percent from critics, ninety two percent from audience. Um, I love this movie. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen up till that date. With 
Matthew Broderick breaking that fourth wall and talking to the audience, yep. and it's like, what is happening here? That was very uh, cool. We had not seen that before in a film. And, uh, and again, it's all about, uh, you know, anti-authority, like getting, uh, fooling, uh, Rooney and, uh, and, you know, at the end, like the sister and, and, uh, Ferris, uh, bond over the fact that they, they pulled one over on Rooney and after um, Charlie Sheen in his cameo talks his, sense oh, to yeah. her. Yeah. And was that his debut? Was that his film debut? Char- uh, Charlie Sheen. I, I do not I know. I think that it was because wow. that might have been the first movie I had seen him in. Um, so yeah, he kind of turns her in the police station there. But I just I love the themes of the movie. Now, I'd be curious to see if you can pull off everything they did within those six or seven hours that you're supposed to be in high school. Could you go to a baseball game? Can you? sing during a parade and then go to a restaurant and, and, and do the all the tower stuff. And, no. yeah, exactly. yeah, art museum you can't and, you no. steal a ferrari and drive into town <laughs> first of all they went they went to a cubs game yeah that's insane first of all <laughs> and an 80 before they did the rules baseball games were three and a half hours yeah mm-hmm. so. so they couldn't have stayed for the no. entire game they had to go in sit down catch a foul ball and get the hell out because that would take up most of your day right there but I um, think one of the really important things about that movie was that even if you were a parent and you took your kids in, the message was carpe diem, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. It was like it, school's important, and you get you get Ben Stein up there, Fu- Bueller, oh. and you know that, which started what war, what war, and <laughs> and nobody, and then he would he would answer for the kids, <laughs> and I think that everybody felt like this is a guy who who he's got it figured out. And I thought, to, I, I, for years, I thought to, I've, I've even told my kids, if you need a day off, it's, and you want to go explore something and do something, and I would, I showed them the, I just do it because it seems like he learned more or experienced more on that one day. Yeah. And everybody thought to himself, oh my gosh, high school is just babysitting, and you should get out, you should be yeah. adventurous and go do things. Now, having a day like that, nobody could do that, but I think that even parents. You know, or or just your average guy who was fifty years old or whatever wandered into that movie would just go, "That was an awesome movie." That yeah. talked to the child in me, and I love that. I there's love a, that about that. That's very much. Coming yeah, to there's a line in the movie. I can't remember if if Cameron said it. I think it was Cameron, but he turned to Ferris and said, uh, or maybe his girlfriend said it. You knew what you were doing when you got out of bed today, which meant he yes. had this whole day planned, yes. and his purpose was to make Cameron lighten up, not take things so seriously. Yes. And the whole day had a purpose. And uh, I loved it. I loved everything about Let it. Let my Cameron go. <laughs> I love that. And the fact that he wore a Gordy Howe jersey right, for right. reasons that I don't fully understand today because it's set in, in Chicago. Chicago <laughs> but he wears a Gordy Howe jersey the entire time. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. In the I, home of Stan Makita and Bobby Hull, you're rocking a <laughs> Gordy Howe jersey. That, that's pretty ballsy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think it was about two months ago or so, Alan Ruck was at the uh, Royal Oak Music Theater. Huh. And I don't know if he had a book to promote, but he was doing like a and a and I think he was also showing Ferris Bueller. And he was also talking about, he was on that show, um, Succession, right? Yeah. And somebody... On Instagram, got a picture of him, and guess what he was wearing? Walking yeah. around downtown Royal Oak, the Gordy Howe oh, wow. jersey. Yep. Can you imagine bumping into him in uh, downtown Royal Oak and go, you're so really cool. wearing the jersey? <laughs> and the first thing he says, Cameron? <laughs> <laughs> the best scene is, I'll go, I'll, I'll go, go, I'll go, I'll go. go. I'll go. <laughs> I just love that. Yeah. Dialogue. That's one of the few movies where cinematography-wise, because I don't really comment, comment on that a lot, but I noticed that the high school was designed, like with Ben Stein, as a prison. Tope, like the the lighting, the hallways, the vibe. Yeah. I went, and then he says, "Look, who could?" And then he opens uh, and he opens his curtain. Who could go to school on a day like yes. this? Yes, right. Yes, it'd be almost criminal. <laughs> yeah, and it, I it might be one of the, if not the first movie to have a post credit scene where sitting through the credits paid off with that very last scene where uh, Principal. he comes out. Uh, and he breaks the fourth wall and he stares at the audience and he goes, you're still here? The movie's oh, over. Oh, yeah. Go yeah. home. And I don't know if we had seen that before. I remember Airplane had a couple of like little jokes in the credits and stuff, but there weren't a lot of movies at that time that Dead, were Deadpool doing. Deadpool parody uh, that. Yeah, yeah. At the end, it's like, what are you still doing? <laughs> Go home. Go home. 
And it was so cool to have the theaters like empty and I'm like sitting there watching the credits and then you see Ferris Bueller come back on the screen. And you're like, what's going on? And what did it cost them to do that? You <laughs> right. know? And you, you just feel so like, thank you. I, yeah. I, I did sit through God knows how many people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and after that, there were a lot of movies that started doing that and you waited. And that's a way to make sure that the audience stays and acknowledges the people that made this movie possible because you're kind of forced to read the credits, hoping that there's going to be some post credit scene. And that was really awesome that they did that. But you kind of wonder, like, his parents love him so much. They never say, all right, buddy, you just get feel better, okay, champ? And Jeannie, what is wrong with you? <laughs> there's always the favorite. I think I can relate to that. Well, I like the idea that he rebelled, but his parents never found out. They yeah. were always on his side, and he was, in a sense, respectful to them. Oh, yeah. Um. But I love the principal when he walks out. My favorite scene is um, Ferris Bueller's there with the Ferrari, and Sloan comes up and he gives her. He goes, "You have a kiss for Daddy," <laughs> and she kisses him. And he's like, he's standing there and he thinks that Sloan's being picked up by her, her father, father yeah, and yeah. her grandmother's died. And he looks and they're making out. And he goes, "So that's how it is." In their family. <laughs> I love that line. That's a great so line. So many good lines. In there. So many good lines. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So definitely a classic. Uh, I even love that in the Charlie Sheen part. He goes, you know, I know a guy you should talk to. If, if you, you say, say Ferris, Ferris Bueller. Oh, you know him. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's yeah. great. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, all right, I'm going to do one more movie, and then we'll kind of go around the table and see what you guys uh, brought to the table. Uh, number five on my list, again, another classic high school movie, uh, 1982's Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Uh, written by Cameron Crowe, directed by Amy Heckerling, who had another uh, hit a few years later with Clueless, um, yeah. starring Sean Penn, who, I mean, this movie basically introduced the world to Sean Penn. Uh, Judge Reinhold, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee, Phoebe Cates, who was, again, America's sweetheart. Smoking. I, yep. I still hope to visit that swimming pool. I do, too. Oh. Um, and, now, that, and that bathroom? <laughs> no, I don't know. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> Slip and Dude. fall in there. I um, love the the cars the cars song in the background. I think it's bow, moving bow. in stereo yeah. or something. Da, 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 da. I always thought you were cute, Brad, or whatever it was she said. Oh, I just love that. Uh. Now, surprisingly, uh, of the movies we talked about so far, uh, this one was not the clear cut uh, box office hit that the other movies were. Oh, uh, it. Only earned $27 million domestically, $50 million worldwide on a $5 million budget. So it did make money, but not on the scale of these other movies that came before it. Um, but when it was released on home video, that's where it found its audience, and a lot of people regard it as a classic. And, and yeah, some Joe, of the. Because uh, they could rewind the Phoebe Cates scene. That's the problem. That's the many? Think about how many VHS copies of Ridgemont High are out there where that part of the tape oh, is it's damaged. Oh, yeah. it's worn. Yeah, where it gets all crinkly and you're like, no. No, no. But um, today, the it's uh, 78% positive from film critics, 80% from the audience. But that wasn't necessarily the case in, in, uh, when it came out in 1982. And one of the criticisms that people had about this movie is that it, it didn't really have a linear story. But that's what I like about the movie is it's – what I would describe as a slice of life. It's just showing the the daily operations of these kids going to the mall to work and encountering issues and yeah. and romance and all that stuff. And it, to me, it's just a, a day in a life like American Graffiti or something yes. like that. That's Not it. necessarily yes. yeah. a story it's... with an arc, but it's just... And, and Amy Hackerling said her goal in directing this film, if I remember correctly was she wanted to create a movie where the audience wanted to be a part of that world. And that's exactly how I feel about it. And I think, Andrew, you and I were talking about this the other day. What I love about the movie is there is no villain in this movie. Now, some people might say Mr. Hand, but even he was a likable character. He was, yeah. yeah. It's like He wasn't like it. Yeah, he wasn't a jerk yeah, about it. Yeah. And everybody in this film, even Damone, who you know got the girl knocked up and then like bailed on her, um, they were all likable characters. Like these are people I wanted to hang out with. And so that's where I get pleasure from this movie is I, i like being immersed in that world with those characters. I really love this. I movie. like what you said about it being a slice of life. Sometimes yeah. I think that having a story arc takes you away from that. Yeah. 
And in this case, you just have a number of vignettes, yeah. kind of, and um, you're getting you're getting different angles, and you're digesting it. So they give you a little bit here, and then they take you in, and then they bring you back. I don't think it would be the same impact if you had if you just had everybody play their entire little vignette all all through. Yeah, it's better to just throw it in, and and so you're digesting every piece. Like, well, what happened to these guys? Oh, what happened to these guys? Yeah, I love that. I think yeah. that's great. It's very European, in my opinion, and okay. sometimes it starts in the middle and it ends in the middle. And yeah. you don't ever find out, you know, and a lot of it's implied. Mm -hmm. Now, some characters do have a little bit of an arc, and the one that I think I love the most is Spicoli, yeah. because throughout the movie, you know, he's just a stoner, slacker, blah, 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 blah. So Mr. Hand visits him at his house, and when he sits down and starts talking about history, he quickly realizes that Spicoli actually learned something during the school year, and he's like, Huh, okay, you showed me that you actually learned something. I will pass you. And I think that's a really cool arc for that character that even though we dismissed him as a slacker, he actually did learn something throughout the film, and I love that about his character. I love so. my favorite Martian. What's his name? Ray. Uh, Ray. Oh, it'll he's come great. to me. Anyway, he's, yeah. I think he's perfect in the yeah. role. Yeah, I love, I love when You've the pizza arrives. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, who wants a slice? Get a good one. I love that moment when he gives away <laughs> Spicoli's pizza. Uh, Nick, your your thoughts and remembrances about uh, about Fast Times? Fast Times, again, this movie, I only saw this once, and I was at the end of high school, and it was one of those things where if you haven't seen it, you can't graduate high school. <laughs> I think it was like the unwritten rule. Yeah. I was like, I better watch this. And I think at the time, because I, I was so used to like straight storylines, linear storylines, that the disjointedness, I was like, can we get back to Phoebe Cates? I don't care about any of the rest of you. I'm like, this is great. But when do we get back to Phoebe Cates? Like, oh, okay, fine. And then, I, you know, Spicoli, Spicoli annoyed me because I've known characters like that. I went to Lasser High School, and I would, I've known a couple of characters like that. And I go, you guys are just, what is your purpose? Like, what do you do? Like, how is your brain not on? But yet, somehow, you are the most adored person in high school. <laughs> and and it's, it's one of those things where, like, when you very first meet him, it's, it's interesting, it's cute, it's charming. And then it begins to wear on you. Oh, yeah. It's like, I've seen your shtick, and I, yeah. I, I know exactly what you meant. Yeah, you, what you mean by that? Yeah. You're like this Monday through Friday, three, like all, the whole time. Like Can you're you really being that you're stupid worse or that, that naive yeah. or that. Like, how do you cross the street? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you bring up an interesting point, not to like get too political or anything, but you know, I've never smoked marijuana. I've had no interest in it. And, but when I hear people argue on its, its behalf and says, well, it doesn't have any ill effects or whatever, I'm like, Anyone who knew the stoner crowd in high school knows that it had an effect on the brain. It did. It, it, and mm -hmm. I don't know if it had long-term effects and what the stoners in high school did after well, they it's graduated. 16, but 17, 18, your brain is still forming. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. don't tell me it didn't yeah. have an impact on oh, those no, young no. brains. It did, and Spicoli's a perfect example. And they of, glorified it. <laughs> right. And that's exactly. not a great idea. I mean, yeah. I, you kind of, I think, mm, to a degree... You say what you want, but sometimes I do think that you you have a responsibility, especially if you're going to glorify like that yeah. some someplace. You're going to get how many? Uh, Ten million kids in the United States smoked pot because of that probably got in trouble, did things that they would <laughs> yeah. have done. I don't know, whatever. The, the one thing about that is, it is because you're as you're growing, it, it depends on the concentration how you do it. There has to be some form. If you're going to try it, then this is what you got. You, there's a way to do it. It's one of the few drugs that you can't get addicted to because it you. Physiologically, you can you can get addicted to the idea of smoking, but you can't actually o overdose on it. Right, right. Yeah. But it was still one of those things where, when you're young, it's like it's like drinking alcohol. You don't when your brain is forming, when you're trying to form habits, when you're trying to you know develop your brain, you don't want foreign substances like this. Willy right. Nilly. And then the glorified to the extent, Spicoli is like we're the cool stoner man. You just have to go and learn to lighten up. <laughs> like, okay, all right. You're going to be fine. Go touch that wire while you're at it. <laughs> For years after, I couldn't see him as anything other than, like, you know, Spicoli. Yeah. I had a really hard time. <laughs> oh, oh, he dude. had to, you know, really focus on breaking out of that stereotype I, that he had. Um, hey, bud, what's your problem? So he went on to become <laughs> just an amazing actor because I think he fought really hard to shed that image yeah. that people had of him. Right. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, you see Spicoli, and his, if that's not what the first movie you've ever seen of him, well, I saw his later films. I saw stuff like Mystic River. Mm -hmm. I saw I Am Sam. And then I see, you know, then, uh, I mean, uh, not Milk. I Am Sam, but 
Yeah. Phenomenal in Milk, Dead Man Walking. Yeah. But uh, there were there were movies in the in the nineties that I saw of him that had nothing to do with Fast Mon- Fast Times at Richmond High. <laughs> and then I saw that later on and I went, Oh, wow, really? Yeah, weird. Yeah. Well, good and, well, good and for you, you. You hear about him like punching a photographer and you're like, Spicoli? Really? I thought you were cool and easygoing, man. Come on. No, but yeah. that, that 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 humanized him for me. I'm like, that's better. That, <laughs> at least it's something at least you're punching that's paparazzi. Real, I don't advocate yeah. violence, but you know, if you're gonna do it and get in trouble, do that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that was my top five. I have another five that we can get to in a little bit, but I want to go around the table and see if uh, you guys can <laughs> talk about movies that uh, we have not talked about yet. So, imagine those, Pete. What's uh, what's top of your list that we haven't touched on? I yet? mean, we we touched on you know Ferris Bueller and American Pie to a certain extent earlier. I mean, I remember that movie when it came out. I I was kind of I didn't I enjoyed it, but I I also felt like hit too close to home. So, but a movie that I enjoy when it's as far as um, going back to school, I don't know if it was the first Harry Potter movie when I first saw it because I I saw that. I went, yeah. Oh yeah, these kids are going to a magic school. Good on you. No parents, bunch of kids, and you get to do magic. I and mean, what could go wrong <laughs> except yeah. everything? No, that's it's funny you bring that up because I was just telling Andrew the other day that I had created my top ten list of back to school movies, and I, I'm like, okay, that's a solid list. This is what I'm going to talk about today. And then I go home, turn on TV scrolling through the guide and I see a Harry Potter marathon and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I totally left Harry Potter off my list. And I'm like, no, Harry Potter has to be on my list. Because- and, and, and I liked it because it's one of those movies where you, you relate to the kid whose first day at school doesn't know anybody. He goes there and he's like, it's an entirely new world. It's like when you move from one, one city to another, you don't know anybody. You're the new kid in school. Like yeah. everyone's, everyone's like, oh, you don't know what this is? Oh, well, I guess you're the new guy. You don't know Which how is this great works. because they're introducing that to us. Right? Yeah, he doesn't exactly. know it, and so we're getting... And you're organically making new friends, and you're kind of gravitating toward each other. And it seeing Harry Potter make friends at school reminds me of, you know, going, oh, you like Star Wars? I like Star Wars, too. And then you, you form these little, you know, I bonds. imagine like, poor Harry has like one of those things like... Oh, you lost your chocolate frog. It jumped out the window. Well, I didn't know it was alive, Frank, Ron, whatever. Why don't you tell me? I just spent all that gold on it, jackass. I but love the fact, it? though, that it is a coming-of-age story mm-hmm. over a number of different things, and a number of different uh, uh, movies. Yeah, a long I'm, haul. A long haul. But, I mean, I think it is the ultimate coming of age like you're going up against things that even adults don't want to deal with and as a ch- child you're doing it which is part of the magic i think is yeah. really cool yeah. he's a teacher who doesn't like him but then the professor like the uh, all the professors like i'm gonna teach you kind of hands off he's like dude i'm new to this world can you guys give yeah. me a break here he's like i felt so bad for that kid well, what I- was cool though is when you get to the later harry potter movies you realize that snape wasn't what we thought he was in those yeah. earlier movies yeah. that he Spoiler. was more of a, a guardian angel than someone who was just trying to provoke Harry Potter. What drove me nuts though, was that by the, about the third or fourth season and they're giving her, you know, the, the, the teachers are giving Harry Potter crap. I'm like, dude, he's saved the world. Now how many times? <laughs> I mean, and you still yeah. are, you still giving him crap. Come on. <laughs> I mean, at some point, aren't you all alive because of him? And I mean, you know, his parents are dead. How do you, I don't know. That was the hard part. He always went. He always reset back to zero. Yeah. Even after the 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 and and yeah, and the somehow start of every just, new school year. Yeah. And like the only person who knew it was uh, Robbie Coltrane, uh, Hagrid. Hagrid, yeah. Kind of understand, and maybe you know Dumbledore. Or whatever, and the but. weirdest thing is, you had the option of staying in the school. They kept forcing him to go back to that hellhole. I was like, why would you make him go back? He could get caught up on the world he never knew for eleven years. Yeah. Oh, so oh, this is what a bad guy looks like. Oh, I got you. Oh, this is cursed. Good to know. Yeah, I was disappointed because <laughs> in the third movie, which is my favorite of all of them, The Prisoner of Azkaban, he gets to meet uh, Sirius Black. And oh, Sirius sir. Black says, you know, oh, you could come stay with me and not have to stay with that awful family. And then they totally abandon that option, and he has to go back to that awful family. That, I yeah. hated that. I hated yeah, that he didn't I have a chance. I wanted to be- see him, like, go go. Because you were rooting fun. for him. Like, we really, but we, I guess they had to get, the, I don't know, whatever. But so when, when we talk about, like, yeah. What an idiot. Thank you. I love that soundboard. No, <laughs> no, that 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 movie uh, struck me, and then uh, uh, you know, American Pie. Obviously, uh, we did Ferris Bueller. For me, a movie that I uh, one of my, uh, in my top five 
with honors. It was a college play. It was with Brendan Fraser and Joe Pesci. It came out in the 90s. Yeah. And Joe Pe- Pesci played this guy, this, you know, guy who, you know, he he lived the American life. He'd, you know, been in the Navy. He had uh, gotten, you know, gotten fired, had got asbestos poisoning, was dying of it, and was basically a, 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 a basically a homeless vet or basically a, a, one of the, uh, they called him a bum, a homeless bum in, in Harvard. And he happens to come across Brendan Fraser's thesis because Brendan Fraser's this guy. He's like, I, I got to graduate with honors and I got to become this, 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 and this. And uh, Gore Vidal plays the professor and he does a brilliant job. Mm. And he says, you know, sir, you will, you will graduate with honors if you, can get, if you can give me this stuff. And he loses it to this homeless guy at the Harvard Library. And it's Joe Pesci. And Joe Pesci reads this like, this is garbage, man. This is your thesis? <laughs> He's like, why am I taking... <laughs> shit from a bum i'm not gonna take <laughs> but and it's this beautiful journey like you see this guy like he learns to lighten up he says he sees the other side and joe pesci and gore have this beautiful exchange in 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 class where he goes you know what eloquence like harvard produces the the best trash <laughs> that produces the best garbage around yeah i've heard good things about that movie i'm gonna have to check it out if I'll, you get I'll a chance it on my to-do list it's a it's it's a fun movie and then the other movie that i brought in here because just for the sake of it was called the faculty it was. It was. Um, that was a dark one, right? Like a murder. Well, it is a sci-fi movie, movie. and it okay. was. It was Elijah Wood. It was um, Josh Hartnett uh, uh, and uh, a, a, a couple others, who uh, uh, Jordana Brewster from Fast and the Furious. They were all high schoolers, hmm. and they basically an alien lands there and <laughs> is trying to take over the factory and take over the school. Never and they have to stop seen it. that one. It was one of those really B-level sci-fi movies, but very underrated. And he, right after he did that, he went went ahead and said, I got to go make this Lord of the Rings stuff. Hmm. So Now, you touched on a movie earlier, and I want to share this quick story. So years ago, uh, I used, as freelance, I would uh, go around with this guy who had a contract to record uh, figure skating competitions. And so I'm riding in this guy's car. We would go to Ohio. We'd go to Indiana. And we'd shoot these figure skating competitions. And one day during the the long, you know, multi-hour ride to one of the locations. Uh, he was talking about how I replaced someone, and I'm like, well, whatever happened to the guy that I replaced? And he goes, he goes, man, all he would talk about is is this script that he was working on. He was working on this script, and he would just wouldn't shut up about it. And one day he said, hey, I can't do this figure skating thing with you anymore. I'm going to go to L.A. and try to sell my script. And I'm like, well, whatever happened to the guy? And he goes, you ever hear of a movie called American Pie? And I'm like, you've got to be what? kidding me. <laughs> that dude is from Michigan. This local guy yeah. said, I'm going to Hollywood to sell my script and did the American dream, went out to Hollywood, turned it into a multi-billion dollar Frank. franchise, yeah. and the guy is probably worth billions. I mean, it's so cool that he was a local guy who made good. And I think that was like, it launched a lot of careers. It launched, um, oh my God, she just did, um, she was in Russian Doll and she just did. Um, Natasha Lyonne? Yeah, Natasha Lyonne. Oh, she's great. Yeah, she was she's great. In, uh, what's that series that she's on now? Uh, on on uh, uh, po- Peacock. Po- Poker Face. Poker, Poker Face. Face, yeah. yeah I, I heard it was great. Good. It's great. fantastic. I think that's yeah. done by uh, oh, wait, Ryan, wait, wait. Ryan Johnson, right? I think so. Yeah, Ryan yeah. Johnson does it. Yeah, exactly. If you yeah. get a chance to watch it, that is a fantastic. She, and she, if she doesn't get an Emmy, or at least nominated, I don't know. They, they I agree. Cancel the Emmys. Yeah. But it launched so many careers. I think that was the first time Shannon Elizabeth was put on there. And uh, Jason Biggs, yeah. Chris Klein, uh, Jennifer Coolidge, who when her name comes up, people go, oh, isn't she Stifler's mom? So uh, Allison Hannigan, who had yeah. famous line about band camp. Jennifer Coolidge. Uh, Eugene so uh, Levy, who was just. Great Eugene Levy is wonderful. And, uh, wonderful. You think yeah, about the yeah. cast and what, what they all went on to do. Really was, yeah. So yeah, and and that movie <coughs> when I and that movie came out right around my high school time. So that was one of those things where you just watch and you go, yeah, this is what a lot of people were talking about. This it, it was always about, par- especially if you're you're in the suburbs. It's like, oh, whose party are you going to? Hey, well, yeah. what class are you go? Hey, do you remember this band camp or chess camp or math <laughs> camp? And you're like, oh my god. Imagine uh, an actor like Eugene Levy, who's you know been around for a long time, Second City and everything. Imagine the read through with for that script. Go, okay, let's uh, let's go to the scene where your son is on top of an apple pie, and he had to be like, "What now? <laughs> what what did I get myself into?" Nick, for your personal personal experience, was it a samosa instead of an apple pie? 
No, 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 no. <laughs> First of all, you don't do man. You, uh, there, there are other. There, uh, it's uh, if you're going to go with anything like that, you first you do you do a donut because it has. A donut. <laughs> oh, jeez. All right, guys. Oh, I'll uh, uh, I'll cut that part out. Yeah. Later. <laughs> no, but uh, no, it was I that that movie was great. I you enjoy the. I enjoyed it, but I also felt like a lot of stuff hit too close to home. So it's one of those things like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, wait, what's he talking about? Yeah. People I know, he's talking about me? <laughs> Fair enough. But uh, no, right. I, I enjoyed American Pie. And it, the sequel was actually not that bad. I was, when I heard they were making American Pie, the sequel said, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Yeah. And then I saw it and went, okay, you're going, it's college, your first year at college. So it's kind of like, you basically just picked up right where you left off. It's not like yeah. 29 years later and everyone's. Well, they did kind of yeah. milk that franchise. They did oh, they yeah. do a, a movie or something called Band Camp, and uh, yeah. they did a whole bunch of. American you you Band hope Band. once after two, you're like, okay, stop. <laughs> this is good. Don't come back to it. You got a nice little uh, pocket. You're good. Move it's on. The golden calf, though, and, man. And, and, kept and, giving. And you saw what was happening to Tara Reid. I'm like, oh, it's starting. <laughs> it's starting. The fave's getting a little too high, and here comes yeah. the drugs and the alcohol. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, he threw a bunch of titles out there. I, Andrew, I, I, I snuck into. Uh, to Great Lakes Crossing Theater to, to see American Pie. Because I think it was only 15 when it came out. Yeah. Look, I, I, I love that, that theater, but I'm going to be honest with you, you really don't have to sneak in there. You could just... <laughs> no, but you did have to when you were 15. Yeah, that's true. You know, to make it fun. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, yeah, to make it fun for you, because you really be like, I'm... You, like, tiptoe past them. They're like, what are you doing, kid? You just want to... Or you have them? a friend wait by the exit door and wait for the secret knock, and we, then they we, open We the would door. use ticket stubs that we had at really bought like a couple weeks before and we would just say to the ticket taker oh uh we just uh had to go to the bathroom or we had to go uh to the concession we're just coming right back in but we never stopped for him to look at we just kept running yeah yeah you know do it with confidence you can get away with anything oh sure um so you're the reason that policy got put in <laughs> yes okay yes uh but yeah um i recently just watched fast times for the first time over the last two nights um, absolutely loved it. I loved how a good chunk of it t- took place in, in the mall. I love movies that take place in malls and hotels for some reason. I, I don't know why. Just Well, the, the malls are so 80s. I mean, there's still malls today, but not like in the 80s. And so the fact that they captured that part of Americana in the 80s, the social aspects yeah. of going to the mall, and there's the movie theater, the record stores, and the food court. The arcade. Ah, nothing like it. I, I didn't know if you were going to talk more about this, but you briefly mentioned uh, American Graffiti. Well, I see, now uh, I don't, even though that falls under the category of coming of age, I didn't really associate it with a school because it, it uh, nowhere is it ever set near a school, in a school, or around a school. It's, it's uh, basically one night, uh, you know, cruising and stuff like that. But it so, was the graduation night, wasn't it? And they were all going to go off to. It might have been the last day of school, and and I and think they're, uh, they're dancing. Uh, Ronnie Howard is dancing. Oh, you're right. There was a was, dance scene. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, there's and a little bit. And yeah. they, the one, I think the principal was getting on Ron Howard's case, and yes. then he's like, "I graduated last year, jerk up." <laughs> so, all right, you're right. There is a scene in the school, but I, I think more of that movie is cars and making out and all that stuff but no it does fall under the category i think of coming of age i i was also going to throw in two wes anderson movies rushmore with jason schwartzman and bill murray absolutely yep. love that movie that was my first wes anderson movie which forced me to go back and watch bottle, bottle rocket, rocket which yeah. i love yes um i don't know if i've ever loved a wes anderson movie since as much as i loved uh rushmore i absolutely love the tone Oh, just the vibe. It's, and... it, it, it is inherently funny because it's a 15-year-old kid yeah. going after a tw- late 20s, early yeah. 30s. competing for the same yeah. woman. Yeah. And so... he doesn't have a prayer with right. this woman. but And he's a, he's an overachiever in every way. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> And I love the line, too, love... when uh, when he's trying to embarrass the one guy, and he's like, what are you wearing? And he's like, my... These are my OR scrubs. And he yeah. goes, oh, are they? Yeah. I just, I don't know why I thought the that line was so and, funny. And Bill Murray's just like. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. That, and then also, I think it came out in 2012, Moonrise Kingdom. Now, I never saw that one. It's on my to-do Joe. list. Excellent. <laughs> I saw no, that. Well, I've seen it. I've seen it twice, and both times I loved I, it. I Great have, cast. I, I have it on DVD, and uh, 
you want to see Bruce Willis portray is he's kind, balding kind, and he's kind of playing the kind, yeah of, it's so he great. kind of against type totally yeah. against he's type. he's uh he's a really like supportive kind of uh like the comb over just does it for I mean, and he's got <laughs> these goofy glasses yeah and he's kind of it's just perfect like i said against type. I, I think it takes place like maybe in the early 70s probably i was um, thinking 50s or 60s maybe 60s whatever. um and then there's this like boy scout type group that are on an island yeah ed um, norton yeah ed norton's in it joe it is excellent uh, it's on my to-do list I excellent need to check it out excellent film um, and the kid is probably only what twelve or so, and it's a it's a great coming of age movie. Yeah, 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 yep. Cool. All right, George, you want to throw some titles? At I, us? I've talked too much. I'm gonna I'm gonna <coughs> I'm gonna give my time to Andrew. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> George wrote down on my piece of paper, and I've never seen it. No, 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 no. Don't go there. No, <laughs> no, no. You haven't seen it. Do something okay. else. Come on. You guys, you guys Dazed and confused. Well, awesome. that was that's next on my list. Actually, let's do it. If we were gonna come <laughs> back to me, number seven on my list. Yes. Number six was the Harry Potter movies. Number seven on my list is Dazed and Confused. Now, I did not see Dazed and Confused in the theaters. It was only after a friend of mine was like flabbergasted that I had not seen it. And he's like, you go home, you watch Days and Confused right now. So, Joe, you got Andrewed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you turned yourself yeah. into a verb? <laughs> Damn it. And I got to say, I absolutely loved it. Yes, uh, yes. It came out in 1993. It's a uh, Richard Linklater movie. Uh, now, this is kind of a, a funny little story. It stars Jason London. Not to be confused with Jeremy London, who is his twin brother. Oh. Now, Jason London was in Days and Confused. Jeremy London was in Mallrats. Mm. Now, a year or so ago, I was at Astronomicon in Livonia, and, and uh, Jer- let's see, Jeremy London was at Astronomicon. And I saw his banner, this like beautiful professionally made banner was hanging behind him. And among the screen credits on the banner, it said Days to Confuse. And I'm like, I was under the impression he was not in that film, but I could be wrong. So I mentioned it to someone who looked at the banner, made a beeline over to Jeremy. And I'm like, oh, no, what's going on here? And I see the guy talk to him. Jeremy turns around, looks at his banner, and was like, who is responsible for this? (laughs) Somebody who created the banner got Jeremy mixed up with his twin brother, or and put the wrong credits on the scr- on the banner. Or was he trying to do some stolen valor stuff? Because hey, we, we look the same. Yeah, yeah, I, I was in that movie. <laughs> no, he he was look. I don't I don't want to say he was upset, but he he had them take the banner down, and uh, I caught it all on video because I was there with the camera. And so I interviewed him uh, afterward, and I said, I imagine that's something you run into all the time. And he goes, yeah. And he says, the funny thing is, is when he tries to tell people who put uh, Days and Confused merchandise in front of him, and they, they go, will you sign this? He goes, no, because I'm not in that. And they're like, yes, you are. And they get really <laughs> upset. And he got to the point where he stopped arguing with people and would just sign his brother's yeah, name. why not? Like, yeah. why spend the time arguing and defending yourself when people would just be as happy if he just signed his brother's name, posed for a picture? Who would know? Nobody would know. They're, but they're twin if, brothers. If one of those fans later on figured it out, if somebody said to him, They'd have a good story to tell. I got <laughs> miffed by it. <laughs> yeah. that, that's like uh, Jessica Chastain and Bryce Dallas Howard. They walk up, you're Bryce Dallas Howard. She's like, sure. And she'll just yeah. sign it. Because people keep confusing them. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, again, this movie was not a, a monster hit. As a matter of fact, it only made $8 million on a $7 million budget. Um, but, again, critics loved it, 93%. Audience loved it, 90%. Wow. So this is another movie that, gain traction after its initial release yeah. on cable and on video and when i finally saw it i was like geez i can't believe i never saw this movie it's really really great yeah i do have some other movies if you if you have yeah, let's get yeah. Back to you. yeah if you don't um so one of them have you seen the perks of being a wallflower never saw that no that's phenomenal I have a niece really, who says really that's her great. favorite book of all time, but I've never seen yeah, it. Yeah, so if you guys haven't seen that, Perks of Being Wallflower is, I want to say, 2010, 2012, and really amazing Was stuff. Emma Watson in that? Yes. Yep. yep, yep. And there are some really epic scenes that go back to, I would say, early 90s kind of feel, um, kind of goth kind of feel, um, but really, uh, it, it, it's about a young guy who goes to school. He's not from the area. And he gets in with the crowd and 
they don't he kind of tries to get in the crowd they kick him out then he does some things and they welcome back in he falls in love with somebody he's not supposed to he finds out things he's not supposed to it's fantastic so that's number one all right if you haven't seen that number two super bad yeah. i absolutely love <laughs> super bad <laughs> Um, the McLovin thing and uh, the, the the cops shooting their own Bill, car and Bill blowing Hader. it up. I, Bill haters. McLovin, McLovin, why? I think I think He's got a Hawaii dress. I, I think it, um, if if American Pie wasn't made, this movie wouldn't have been. Made. I think there's some pretty oh, I, American, American Pie. Like, there's a lot of DNA yeah. in it. Yep. Oh yeah. Now my problem with Superbad sometimes my opinion of a movie is affected based on the circumstances in which I watched it okay imagine i was at my sister's house we were having some sort of get together it might have been a birthday it might have been a holiday so there were people of all ages sitting in the living room and someone said what what do you want to watch and someone said let's pop in super bad and we had to turn it off like 10 minutes into the movie it's like when when the one character's mom is like leaning in through the car window and and (laughs) i'm like no no we we can't watch this and, and I was embarrassed and horrified, and I tried to give it another chance when I was watching it by myself, and maybe I was just soured on that experience, but I, I thought it was juvenile. And oh, it's I, totally I just, juvenile. Oh, if, you, if you didn't turn it's it It's a 1 a.m. movie yeah. that you cannot, you can't look at it in the light of clear, clear <laughs> eyes in the bright of day. It just, if, it doesn't hold up. If you didn't turn it off at that point, you would have turned it off at the house party. It's like, <laughs> I got period blood on my leg. I love you. Use my leg as a tampon. Yeah. I, mean, I was like, uh, all right, all right, all right. Why let's, would you move, let's move forward then. <laughs> why would you use the Muhammad or McLovin? <laughs> Muhammad's the most common name in the world. Look at him, read a book. Just, all right, so the next one I think that we've missed out is Stand By Me. I oh. really love Stand By Me. That was on your list, wasn't it? No, because, again, you guys kind of insisted that we include coming-of-age movies. I wanted to kind of strictly stick to school movies. So oh, my okay. list my bad. doesn't necessarily include... You would have included it. I would have included it if we just did coming-of-age movies. But, again, in Stand By Me, it's like summer vacation, so there's no classroom setting there's no teachers there's no okay. principals so even though i do like the movie um i i didn't include it on my list yeah so the thing i liked about stand by me is that it's one of the few stephen king movies that actually rocks it's pretty darn good yeah um you've got uh, river phoenix before he you know grows up and passes yeah. away um you've got um just some really good like um when you're a kid you can go on an adventure like, and this is an adventure. They leave home. This is an actual, like, coming of age, boy to man. Yeah. You deal with the bullies. Your yeah. parents aren't there. I had to go to camp to, to, to you know, and in, in the summers. And I absolutely loved it because I get to be get to be away from my parents. And you can be whoever you want. And here you are. You're out with your friends and you're telling stories and you're joking about who's got the, the largest unit in three counties or whatever. <laughs> I love the, the, the banter. And I've, I saw that when I was a kid. I was like, eh, it's okay. And then as I've gotten older, it really is a love letter to being, I don't know, 13 or whatever yeah. it is. Oh, sure. And um, anyway, it the, having what's masterful about it is that it, it, I think it was called originally The Body. Is that right? Yeah. You want to and, see a dead body? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so you have that hanging in there, but the whole movie isn't scary. It's just that that's the thing <coughs> that pushes everybody toward that logical conclusion that this is going to happen and everybody's nervous, but then there's also the bullies and everything else. I absolutely loved it. what do you think? I never saw it. Oh gosh. No, <laughs> never saw Sam by me. Nick? I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I, cause I, oh, a, because of the characters that were in there and all the actors like Will Wheaton watching Will Wheaton, which one's yeah. Will Wheaton. Um, he was Wesley Crusher in the uh, yeah. Star Trek uh, series. Oh, and, the, the, he's uh, one. He's basically the, he's uh, the Richard Dreyfuss as a yeah. kid. Oh yes. Yeah. He's awesome. And, uh, and and then yeah, seeing River Phoenix and I I love the part like the things that stand to me like and these are stuff that little pop up anywhere like the train scene the body scene just them it was them saying you know it's all it it almost to me felt like they were not going to have that kind of summer again and so they all decided to go out and do something and I I enjoy stories like that there's a, a flight of the navigator or, or what is it. Yeah, there are movies like the word. I forgot the name of it, but it's three kids who go into space because they build. Was their it own explorers? Space. Explorers. Yeah, or something yeah. Like that. Oh, nice call. 
But um, no, I I enjoyed Stand by Me. Uh, I really I should actually go back and watch it. It's been a while now. It's been more than a decade since yeah. I've seen it. Well, that's why I, you know I'm not going to be too tough on Andrew because <laughs> despite being a teenager in the '80s and seeing everything, I I never really sat down and watched Stand by Me from beginning to end until maybe a few years ago when I'm like, okay, you know what? I need to make an effort here. And I sat down and watched it and really liked it a lot. And I was, I was like, why did this movie elude me for 30 years? I finally sat down and dedicated some time to watch it and really liked it. So no. it was just one of those things. I thought when George was going to pick a Stephen King movie with school, I thought it was going to be it. <laughs> I was yeah, I, it, I, I, I that was on my it's list too. One. I was going to say that, and I thought, no, let's just only do one. I love the first part of it yeah. because it's all about the kids, and once again, right. it's all about them bonding together against po- common enemy bullies. Exactly, and then also something that they perceived as larger than themselves. So you could also call this a World War II movie, yeah. but instead of the war and having <laughs> the, all the people going off to this unknown monster, the monster's right there in the town with them. And I love, I love those how they kind of work their way. Yeah. But I think that's I think that's where Stephen King got a lot of his stuff was this post World War II guy that yeah. just had yeah, all yeah. these yeah fears that Joining wound up forces against the common enemy. Yeah. Initially, that's when you said stand by me. I'm like, oh, that's a yeah. I I, I wouldn't have th- thought of that as a, like a I, that, that completely would have gone underneath my radar. That's why I was when we were thinking about school and coming of age. Well, like, and so it's the coming of age thing. So yeah. I did slide it under the door under that yeah, under yeah. that asterisk. But the, there it is. I have a, a two more movies. We touched on most of my list. Uh, we did Days of Confused. We did Rushmore. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up Clueless, which I touched on <laughs> yeah. earlier. That might be you know, one great. of the biggest coming-of-age films of the 90s. came out in 1995. Yeah, Again, was... written and directed by Amy Herkeling, who did Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Uh, Alicia Silverstone, whose portrayal of Cher was iconic iconic um Stacy Dash Brittany Murphy and Paul Rudd Rudd who hasn't aged a day since then he was 40 in that role no, no. He was not. <laughs> but <laughs> He's still the one thing that bugs me about Clueless is the romantic aspect between Cher and Paul Rudd's character when they're stepbrother and sister. I'm like, oh, that's kind of why? Yeah. That part, yeah. Why did you go there? Yes, I did I'm, not I'm expect glad I've it. never seen this movie. Yeah. I, I remember when I saw it for the first time, I'm like, really? I mean, yeah, they, they kind of like had this chemistry throughout the film, but I never thought they would pursue the romantic angle, yeah, and that's that, exactly what they did. That came out of left field for me. I went, oh, oh weird. wow, that's weird. Then I kept thinking about the Brady Bunch. Yeah. Oh, and the Brady Marcia Bunch, I think, is and, uh, weird, but this, Greg, this yeah. doesn't seem the same. They're kind of already, their cement is already cooled and dried for them by the time they meet each other. So I don't think Ugh. of them as like little kids growing up side by side using the same bathroom like the Brady Bunch. So yeah. that's that. I'm not near as freaked Still, out by it. I don't know. Uh, it earned $88 million on a $12 million budget, God, wow. uh, 81% from critics, 76% from audience. Uh, the other film I want to bring up, this is just, uh, I guess you can call it a guilty pleasure. I want to talk about Back to School, 1986. <laughs> Rodney, Rodney Dangerfield's follow-up to Caddyshack. Caddyshack made him a movie star, and uh, he followed it up with Back to School. And he was a little bit more <laughs> polished in Back to School. He was he was still kind of a, a belligerent, you know, oaf in Back to, the school, Back to School. But the movie was more <laughs> polished than, like, Caddyshack was. Um, but it's basically about a guy who sends his son off to college, and then he's like, you know, I never finished college. Uh, maybe I'll go to back to school with you. And it's about this old guy going back to college. And it was a lot of fun. A big hit, $91 million on an $11 million budget. Wow. Uh, Sally Kellerman, when uh, I love the line when he uh, Rodney asks her out on a date. She's like a teacher or whatever, and she says, I can, I have class. And he goes, well, call me when you have no class. I love that line. Uh, <laughs> Keith Gordon, who was in Christine, he was in that. Yeah. Um, Terry Farrell and uh, Billy Zopka. I have a, a, another cool little story about that. Um, uh, there was a Karate Kid reunion at the Motor City Comic Con, and uh, Ralph Macchio and Billy Zopka, who were in Karate Kid together, uh, were at the show together. And... As I'm shooting video, I see Terry Farrell come over and give Billy Zabka a big hug. And uh, I kind of capture the whole thing on video. And then he had to go off and do, like, some personal photo stuff. And uh, when he walks away, I'm left with Terry Farrell. It was a beautiful, beautiful woman. She was on Star Trek, uh, what, 
Deep Space Nine or Voyager or something. I don't yeah. know. Um, but I'm like, what was that all about? Like, why are you hugging Billy Zapka? And she's like, we were in back to school together, and I haven't seen him since we did that movie together. And I caught that moment on video, and I'm like, oh, my God, I totally forgot about nice. that. So it was really neat seeing them reunite for the first time since back to school. And uh, I really love the movie. I think it's laugh out loud funny and um, and so he had kind of a string of hits. He followed that up, I think, with Easy Money, where he's like this oafish millionaire. And uh, then he took that serious turn in, uh, uh, what was the Woody Harrelson uh, serial killer movie? Oh, yeah. I didn't, uh, I didn't natural, natural, natural Born Killer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a role in that. Um, but, yeah, uh, Rodney Dangerfield, you know, he established himself as a movie star with Caddyshack and then had a string of hits after that. So that was pretty cool. Um, I do have a couple of honorable mentions. Uh, one movie that really surprised the heck out of me because I was I went in with very low expectations, but I was uh, went into the theater to see the theatrical remake of Twenty One Jump Street, uh, wow. which came out in two thousand twelve, and that had Jonah Hill, Channing Tatum, and it was much much better than it needed to be. It was very very entertaining and funny, and on a fifty million dollar budget, this surprised me when I looked this up. $200 million on a $50 million budget on the movie version of 21 Jump Street. And then nice. they did a sequel, 22 Jump right. Street, where they moved across the street. And that was just as good as the first one. And Wait, did you say 15 or 50? 50, 50, 5 0. 5 0. Uh, and yeah. they got two, so, they squeezed 4X so out of that. 200 million on 50 million. And uh, it was a laugh out loud funny movie about cops infiltrating a high school dressed as students and they poked fun at the whole concept and premise and it turned out to be a very very enjoyable movie and then uh, finally you know we may have talked about this on the podcast before but I wanted to throw out three titles that all feel like the same movie and in some cases the same actor is in <laughs> two of these movies I'm talking about Goodwill Hunting, 1997. Oh, yeah. Dead Poets Dead Society, Society, 1989. And The Holdovers, 2023, which, when you break it down, they're all basically the same movie. They're the mentor, professor, or someone in a position of authority bonding with a student or yeah. multiple students. A troubled student. Yeah, yeah. and uh, showing them the way. And they're all very similar. And I enjoyed all three movies. I wouldn't include them in my top 10. They were all enjoyable in their own way, but yeah. they're all very, very similar movies. And when, when I saw the, saw the holdovers, people were like, oh, did, did you like it? And I'm like, I liked it, but it, we've seen it yeah. before. It's it's a recurring theme in film. You'll get great performances. Every one of those movies had Oscar nominees. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. And, and, you know, what's the movie with Morgan Freeman where he's the teacher in the inner city classroom who... You know what was it? It was also stand and deliver. The, uh, was that that, it? that oh, that was stand um, and deliver was uh, Edward James almost. almost yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So we we've seen those themes before, and they're all school related. But I don't know. I'm always desperate for something that hasn't been done before, something that's new and unique. And it's like, okay, let's break away from that formula and give oh, us something. And, and different. some of them are a little bit heavier too when it comes to. Like with Good Will Hunting, and you think yeah. of the character, what, what Will was like in Dead Poets Society, what happens to them. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, but I think like School Days, with Spike Lee's School Days, you know, the political activism and, and what they went about it. It was, you know, movies like that, like you watch them and they're enjoyable, but, you know, that's not the first thing you, when you want to think of a, a back to school movie, you don't pop in School Days or or Dead Poets Society, you probably watch Breakfast Club. You probably watch right, Ferris exactly. Bueller, something or super bad or something like that. Yeah. All right. If we uh, wrap up now, we can keep this podcast under 90 minutes, which we have uh, not done recently. I got 20 uh, seconds. <laughs> Go ahead. Have you guys seen The Way, Way Back with no. Steve Carell? I have not. Oh, it's a good indie. Well, it was Fox Searchlight. It's Fox's indie. Yeah. I love indie. So yes. $5 million made $27 million. It's about this kid who goes on a a summer like uh trip to this water park his his mom is tony collette and she's dating steve carell who plays against type as a as a jerk hmm. uh, and treats the kid like trash wow. and the kid is just really kind of isolated he befriends uh the guy who owns the water park it's played by the excellent sam rockwell hmm. 
And it's just excellent Sam Rock. Just one of those movies that you watch it, you feel so bad for the kid. It's extremely realistic. Hmm. It's 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 funnier than I expected it to be. The guys who wrote the movie have small parts in the movie. Uh, you remember the dean from Community? Yeah. He, him, and this other guy wrote the movie. Oh, nice. So yeah. I highly recommend. It's one of those movies that you once you see it, you say, "How did I not see this?" It's <laughs> so so good. So that's that's my. Uh, out of left field. All right. Movie. The way, way back. Yeah. The way, way back. Now, one movie I thought about including in my top 10, and I'm like, no, I mean, I don't really think of this movie as being a school movie, even though large chunks of it are set at school. Uh, back to the Future. You sure. you could argue that it's a school movie, but to me, it's more science fiction comedy. But, you know, the origins of the film is uh, the, the, uh, Bob Gale, who wrote it, was like flipping through his father's high school yearbook and found a picture of him and was like, oh, my God, that's my dad. And he started wondering, like, if I were to go back and meet him today, would we be friends? Would we get along? And that kind of inspired the whole time travel element of the movie. So you could argue it's a back to school movie, but uh, we'll save that one for another day. Sure. On that note. We'll see you next time Come to the on Hollywood Blockbuster. Watch Charlie Chaplin and put some sunshine into your day. Forget the hard times. Come to the movies and try to laugh your troubles away.